two-hour session. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's uh, a real privilege to be here, and I feel very humbled in, in, uh, in this particular audience. I am a, uh, I like to characterise myself on my Twitter feed as a practical geographer. I'm not an academic. I work uh, in the policy space, mainly around international development. And uh, so I'm, I'm coming at this from, from that perspective, really, uh, not from the New University of Newcastle, uh, but really with, a, with, with a, a head on that says, OK, well, what's particularly around uh, the way that the political economy of the response to uh, the challenges of the time, what can that tell us about what the, how are we going to respond in the anthropocene? Um, uh, Okay, I mean, if I think about the Anthropocene, I think about it really about the challenge is going to be about managing the, the tragedy of the commons. I think we're all being aware of, of uh, <coughs> Garrett Hardin's concepts there. Um, I mean, I think one of the things, I've put the square brackets in there yeah, intentionally because I think a lot of people, particularly for a kind of uh, response to this, about the, the, the response to, to the new ideas uh, about managing the tragedy of the commons has been maybe a neoliberal approach, um, and we can get into the, the communist and privatisation and all that in a minute. Um, but essentially, I think the original idea was about saying it's about, the, the challenge is going to be about the, the, the unmanaged commons. And within that, it's saying actually one of the things we need to do to, to, to manage our future is, or to cope with the, the tragedy of the commons, is going to be actually management. And as, as somebody who works in a, the political economy space, and particularly around international development, and particularly in Africa, a lot of the, the, the ideas at the moment are around actually the, the overcoming what's called collective action problems. And I think one of the, the key issues about this quotation, it's going to look down here, is about the problem overcoming collective action problems around having passive institutions with full sort of rules. We, get, we need rules to cope with the challenges of the Anthropocene. We know that with the squeeze, the tragedy of the commons, we're going to need those rules. So so that individuals can be constrained from acting in their individual, immediate individual interests so that then it can benefit our collective self -interest. And it would be extremely remiss of me to be at Indiana University and not mention uh, perhaps one of the greatest daughters of this university, Anna Ulstrom. Now, who, as a Nobel laureate, as I'm sure everybody in, in the room remembers and knows, talked about how to manage and create institutions for common pool resources. The earth, what is the scale of the common pool resources? A lot of the research was about local, but in fact what we're talking here is about managing a river as a con rivers as conical resources or, or watershed, but actually we're talking also about the globe. It's fantastic to have that video to start off with this session. And say actually this is where this is what we're talking about now. We're talking about dealing with the, the global challenge. I just want to pick out a few of the, of the concepts that she raises here. Clearly found boundaries, uh, rules are required, choice so that so that people can actually participate in decision making, effective monitoring by monitors, you need to have sanctions so you can enforce the rules, maybe it's a conflict resolution. Self-determination but measured with actually balanced with higher level authority, um, so that things can maybe can be imposed. And then for, and that's particularly relevant for larger common resources, you need to have kind of multiple layers of addressing the challenges and managing the rules at different layers. And I kind of think about really, also, it's always good to think about the military thing. One of the things they also say, and the quadrennial defense review in 2010, every four years of defense review, talks about climate change, talks about uh, rivers in particular. But it says here that the likelihood of conflict in river basins arises the way ecological and human change within these basins exceeds the institutional capacity to absorb that change, the appropriate rules. If those are not in place, 
you don't have that institutional capacity, we're going to have more conflict. So that's kind of a conceptual kind of basis of it. Um, but yeah, okay, so what? Well, it's always been like that, really. We've, we've looked in, in that initial um, uh, video, this part of the world was mentioned, created for civilization. Oh, my gosh, went to war. I'm sure a lot of people know this story, right? The gash <laughs> here canalized the river to bypass the comma. They went to war, that was recorded on uh, parts like this, which are now in the Louvre. So, this is 2000 years BC or 1750 BC. These don't just record the story of the war and the use of water as a weapon, but also record the rules that were treated, if you like, after the war, and said, okay, this is how we're going to regulate this common resource. So, really, since a long, long, long time ago, we've had that, the process of managing our space through rules and regulatory arrangements. Now, just to go back to the military a minute, we talked a little bit a minute, uh, we've talked a little bit about risk multiplier, the rate of change. Yeah, okay, so having an idea that says it's always been like this, that's not acceptable now because the rate of change is so great. No, you're right. The rate of change is rapid, that McDonald's graph that Andy showed us. But the fundamental issues are the same. We need new rules for the new context. And but what we've got is a risk multiplier effect. And that's why the military, that's why in 2009 the CIA has a, now has a centre, probably you guys will work for it, the Centre for Climate Change. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so that's, so we're in, the, we're, in, we're in this kind of new world, as we know, but actually the basics are the same. So what, what's going to be, in the British language, fit for purpose? And then one final thing, is really I just put this up, because... Just to remind ourselves about sustainable development, what it means, but again, it's this idea of commons. When Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Commission puts forward, um, came up with a definition, working definition, that's still used in my world a lot, of what sustainable development is, it used that language of our common future. And just before I move to the time, I just want to introduce you to some little piece of work that I was involved in. Western Orissa, uh, both in Gaul, Western Orissa, this little bit here, these are all districts of Orissa. I'm working down this, I'm sitting in a, in a, in a village here, which is one of um, 120 villages that supported to a 120 million pound project. It's based on catchments, it's based on rehabilitation, we use that language, catchments, stabilisation of slopes, creating a rainwater catchment. Uh, to maintain flow, irrigate the load, this is obviously rice, this is rice paddy here, this is tea that's been planted. The reason I'm showing this is because um, integrating development approaches that use the boundary of the watershed, uh, local scale and larger scale, and this is obviously the Helen Ostrom stuff as well, has been incredibly effective at dealing with livelihoods. And, and from my point of view, I think. Looking at the Earth's surface as a unit, the basic units of the Earth's surface is bounded by the watershed in terms of both how we call ecosystem services, but also in terms of governance, so that you organise it, is an incredibly powerful uh, way of looking at the surface of our Earth. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But I just want to put one other thing about this, is that one of the reasons the British were supporting this and requested the Indian government to say to risk them, was because this was the instead of context. This actually area was completely surrounded by Maoist rebels. Maoist rebels were a big problem. Naxalites were a big problem in that part of the world. One of the reasons that they were able to get a toehold in that area was because of environment change, environment degradation, political instability. Stabilization of that, that area from a, from a political point of view was completely linked to uh, environmental stabilisation of the slopes, as it were. As soon as you had that, people had more stable livelihoods, people had more, more predictable 
lines, you didn't have, you actually removed a lot of the drivers for, for that. So if we go back to that Pentagon quote, this is real. And these are not, you know, these are not abstract. Uh, this is not, those, those people are not abstract. They're real people who you can sit down and you can talk to. Um, they're not urban, but they're all. So then moving completely away from that to another boundary of watershed. Um, the time, in comparison to what we just heard, it's, it's obviously much smaller. Uh, you haven't got problems of trying to boundary challenges like you have in lots of places. You've got Scotland there, and the watershed is the, is the boundary. Um, you've also got, effectively, and Andy, you're probably going to not, probably tell me this is completely wrong, but effectively, you've now got uh, the main period of rapid change over. In this, in, this, in this watershed. We've now got a uh, fairly stable urban environment, well, that's some changes, but essentially that is now, in terms of the state, the, the, the change is gone. The change was a lot earlier, which is very different from all the other contexts we're talking about. Why is that important? I'll come to that in a minute. So, what did we do? Well, very quickly, all we did is look at the legislation, classified it by different scales and classified it by different types. And I apologise for this, I think visually. But if you look at the different legislation, you've got global at this level, European, uh, national, regional, and then the local. Each of those different colours represents a different type of legislation. And just to kind of talk a little bit about each of some slices, and then look at what that might mean for, for some of these the broader themes. Slice one. I'm going as fast as I can. 1842, 1900. Fish, salmon. Sal salmon has become totemic in the, in, in, over the last two days. But salmon have come up again and again and again. Why is salmon important here? It's elite interests. It's about preservation of uh, landowner rights, rich rights to, for, for salmon for those areas. Public health acts, these two. Um, Claudia talked about the great stink yesterday in Germany. No, the public health up there is a response to the Great Stink, where the massive pollution, particularly the cholera epidemics in, in London. So you also get reactive policy making. Okay? So you've got elites, elites kind of control as the population grows, they want to maintain their, their resource and their access to salmon. You get, you get a bit of reactive policy making here, which is about um, making sure that I mean, effectively there's, there's the public health is maintained, that comes out. But other than that, there's not a lot there, really, is there? Slice two, legislation. Colours start to get more, individual legislation starts to become certain more functions. Now, listen. 1968, the first conservation, we'll pick it up in a minute. Here we go. Again, salmon is still here. Land drainage act is really important because that's the first one that actually says we're going to manage the watershed, the area, as a single unit. That's the first time that begins to happen. There's been particular issues up to that point. Um, prior to this point as well, you've got the management of the rivers, the river essentially being a board of conservators who are essentially representing the uh, interests of landowners and fisheries. Uh, the people with the salmon issue. And then, what happens here is a huge change. 1945, you begin to get democratisation. Um, suddenly, you get a National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act that says, hold on a minute, post-1945, post the war, a new social settlement in the UK, actually what, what we value, the, the countryside, everybody should have value to access to it. And you start then getting a change. But the big change isn't there. The big change is now. Slice three. And that's the 1973, and I didn't know you were going to be here, John, is, is the European Union. And the world utterly changes. The world utterly changes to this point. And suddenly what you get is European Union directives. 1973, uh, and I, I apologize for this next slide. <laughs> <laughs> The European Community Act says, um, you can have a European directive. If you have a European directive, 
as a European, European country member, you have to comply with it. We don't care how you do it. So you have all of these kind of directions to say, well, you, know, you have to clean up the water. You have to get rid of hydrocarbon uh, uh, um, and different kinds of metals and water, etc. You then get more and more progressive changes um, that lead through to what we've already talked about, um, which is the water framework directive here, and I'm leaping ahead. That's transformative because what that talks about is integrated management of the watershed. So what you've got is you've got a trajectory from the particular, from, from elite interests really, uh, through a process of democratization of the more democratic looking at the democratic space, and saying that the land is the space is more, more a common resource towards something that actually we now have some of the things we have environmental assessments coming in, you know, much more sophisticated legislation. So we talked already about this 2011 white paper. What's interesting about this is it's actually saying it has to be integrated. Because the integration of environmental, economic, social, and the catchment scale, and he's already talked about that. And it's also also talked about this white paper, this uh, word for livelihoods as well. If you remember what I was talking about when I was talking about uh, Adisha, those ladies. It was a rural livelihoods program, that was how it was framed. It's about saying actually there's no separation between our engagement with the environment and ourselves. And, and effectively, what, I, what I'm suggesting is you've got, you've got some phases here. You've got the first phase, which is really right away until 1945, where the majority of the, the legislation is actually about exclusion. It's actually about excluding individuals to protect particular rights. And Claudia, I think you used some of this language yesterday. And then, yes, this next section, which really runs all the way up to, I think, the next section to the EU, or the lunch of the European Union, is about incorporation. It's about bringing all the, the, the control the space together, incorporating it so it's more under a unified management, either through local authority legislation or through other legislation that actually said we're going to manage this. Then it's saying, actually, we're going to integrate that much more together in, 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 through the European Union. But notice this, the only way you can have more integrated management is by the create is by European Union legislation. That I think is absolutely fascinating because what up here you've got external normally externally saying we value particular things. Um, we talked about time rivers trust time rivers trust and I'm kind of reaching ahead of it. Um, essentially I think what, what the Time River Trusts do is they are acting to act as a, as a, a check and a balance on uh, and, and support the integrated management. You've talked very eloquently about social monitoring. And I can remind you of some of those areas that Ellen Olsen talks about, the need for monitoring within. Um, I'm, I'm kind of leaping all over the place now at the time. But I want to show you this, this bit as well. That, what I think is changing rapidly in the UK is about how we value our environment. And what we're saying, we've talked a lot today yesterday about value. And I think what we're saying is that we, we, have, we are recognising in the UK that post-1968, post some of the acts, that there is actually now saying we value the environment even of itself. It has virtue, not for necessarily uh, ecosystem services defined narrowly in, in economic terms. I think there is. And what we're trying to do actually is we're trying to say how we recognise the virtue by putting a financial um, identity to that. Just want to make this point. That's Conservative Party membership between 1928 and 2008. That's Labour Party membership. That's Liberal Democratic Party membership. That's uh, the National Trust. If anybody knows what National Trust is in the United States, Green. That's a people go to visit. National assets that are taken into national ownership. But the, one of the most interesting actually is the red one there. That's the membership of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. There are more people who are members of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds than are the politi major political parties combined. <laughs> right? Why? Why is that? What is that saying as a society about what we value? Um, this is uh, Greenpeace, that's the Royal Club there. That's the country I've taken from Green from the, the Club there's bottom. So that's, that's, that's about people mobilizing. Very quickly, the, the story is this, I think. 
It's about incremental developments contrary to a period of many revolutions. From exclusion to incorporation to integration to participation. From the particular to the universal. From saying, you know, we're not going to regulate for individuals. And that's what this, a lot of this conference has been about. They're trying to bring things together. From value to virtue. To saying there is value, there is a virtue of doing this. It has, in and of itself, it's worth doing this. And then from elites to, co to the commons, that we're saying actually now there's going to be greater participation. Like what Andy was talking about was social media being used to, to act as, uh, to, do, to, to do that process of, of both policing and monitoring, but also to, to bring. But that contestation is, throughout, is continuing throughout. And one last point I, we work with uh, leaders. Um, there's something called the High Level Panel of Fragile States, which has just been. Uh, just reported that with many African leaders, we were providing a lot of the backstopping for that. Um, there's a principle called Do No.